peace of the Lord be with you. We are so glad to see you on this first Sunday of Advent. I just want to say a little bit about Advent before we get started this morning. The Advent for the Christian is the beginning of the church's new year. It is a period of spiritual preparation in which many Christians make themselves ready for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. We get ready by celebrating Advent as a season of prayer, a season of fasting, and a season of repentance. We celebrate to thank God for Jesus who came to us as a baby. We also celebrate his presence among us today in the Holy Spirit. And we make preparation for his triumphant return. The Advent wreath to my left here is a circle with four candles arranged around the wreath, with one candle in the center that represents Christ. During the season of Advent, one candle on the wreath is lit each Sunday. Each will represent one of the four themes of the Advent season. And this Sunday, we celebrate and light the candle of hope. In a few minutes, we'll have our readers to come forth with our Advent reading and the lighting of the first candle. But at this time, let us bow our heads in a moment of silent meditation. Let us prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Let us in our own ways invite the Spirit of the Lord to come within our hearts and minds that we might worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, Tracy will lead us in a song, and our Advent readers will come. Uh, Barbara Brown and Howard Wine will be our readers today.
was a year we needed Advent. This is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us in Isaiah 64, 1, 9, 64, 1. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains will be, will quake at your presence. 64, 2, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nation might tremble at your presence. 64, 3, when you did not when you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quake at your presence. 64.4, from ages past, no one has heard. No ear has perceived, no eyes have seen any God beside you who works for those who wait for him. 64.5, you meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. And 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteousness deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take away, take us away. 64 7, there is no one who calls on your name or attempt to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquities. 64 8, yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our the potter. We are all the work of your hands. 64, 9. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember your iniquities forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thank you, God. Good morning. We light this first candle as a sign of hope. Hope that you can meet us even in the mess of, the, of our world. Hope that you still see us, though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that bring us to Emmanuel once more. for the gospel. The gospel lesson is Mark 13 chapter 24 to 37 and it reads But in those days after that suffering the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the power of and the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then they will send out the angel and gather his elected from the four winds from the end of the earth to the end of the heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson as soon as the branch become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that, this, that he is near and at the gate. Truly I tell you, 
This generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. But about that day, our hour, no one knows, neither the angel in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leave home and put his slave in charge, each with his work, and command the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or dawn, or else he may find you asleep when you come suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Wine. At this time, let us prepare our hearts for our pastoral prayer. And as always, we ask you to be mindful of those that are sick and shut in today, those that are hospitalized, those that are homeless in the streets, those that are locked behind prison bars, those that are going through bereavement, and those who are lost in this lonely world, overcome by the things around them and the things that they see and the things that they hear. We ask that you pray for them all, as we also pray for ourselves. I know that there are people in your hearts and minds this morning that you're concerned about, and as always, we give you an opportunity to lift up those names that they may be included in all of our prayers. Are there any this morning? struggles in the midst of our strife. We come to you in the midst of our trials and tribulation and even Lord our temptation. We come to you Lord because we don't know where else to go. We come to you Lord because we know that you have the answer. We come to you, Lord, because we know that you're willing to listen to us this morning. But not just listen. You're willing to help us through. So we come this morning, Lord, asking for a blessing. We've called so many by name, and there are so many, Lord, that whose names weren't called. But we pray for them too, Lord. We pray for them in the midst of their trials and tribulation, in the midst of their strife, in the midst of their temptations. We ask, Father, that you would have mercy upon all of us. As the elders of the church used to say, as they were bended on their knees, they would say, have mercy while mercy can be found. Have mercy on us, Lord. For we know that we have not done everything you've asked us to do. We know that we have not gone to all those places you've asked us to go. We have not said that which you've asked us to say. 
We come admitting our shortcomings. We come admitting our failures. We come admitting them, Lord, and asking for your forgiveness. We come, oh Father, asking that you would just be here with us this morning. For we know, Lord, that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you will be there in the midst. And Lord, we are few in number this morning, but we feel your spirit already here. We felt you, Lord, as we came through the doors because this is your house and this is Sunday morning. This is Sunday morning. The Lord's day. And we come to give you thanks. We come to give you praise. We come, Lord, just to say thank you. You've been good to us. Bless us now in this worship service. Bless us now, Lord. For we look to you, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to you, Lord. Because we don't know anywhere else our blessings will come. Bless us. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Let the church say amen. amen. The church say amen again. Amen. Let the church say amen one more time. Thank you, Lord. As we enter the Advent season, and as we light the first candle, let us recall the words of Isaiah in chapter 9, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. When Isaiah wrote these words, when he wrote this message for the people of God, Israel was at war with Assyria, and they were on the verge of being conquered, all because of their disobedience to God. This initial promise of the Messiah gave hope to those who thought 
there was no hope. For them, this proclamation changed everything. Now there was a promise of better times. Now there was a promise from the word of God that filled them with hope. Have you thought about how we use the word hope in our daily lives? Every day we use the small word as though it's magic. We say things like, I hope it doesn't rain. I hope you feel better. I hope my children are safe. Those students uh, that are studying right now are saying, I hope I can get an A in this class. I hope she likes me. I hope he likes me. I hope to make a difference in the world. I hope to get a raise. Today, what are your hopes? Is it for a better life? Is it for a better career, a brighter future for you and your family? Maybe some of us are saying right now, I hope this preacher got something to say this morning. <laughs> hope is a vision of better days, a vision so bright that it changes our present mindset. With hope, we began to see that there's something up ahead. With hope, we began to see that there's something around the corner, there's something good is going to happen. And we believe it so much so that it causes us to hold on just a little while longer. It causes us to keep heart when we think about giving up. It causes us to be optimistic when we are doubtful. It causes us to keep moving forward instead of turning around. Hope reaches in and it transforms us. Here's an example. Again, I'll bring up the students that are studying right now. If they're hoping for an eight in a particular class, they do more than just wish for that A. If they're truly hoping to get an A, hope won't let them rest and sit there and wait on it. Hope will motivate them to get up and to study and to study again and to study until they understand. If someone is hoping to get a raise, they don't sit around and say, well, I hope it happens. No, it causes them to work harder because hope gives us a vision of better days, and that vision changes our present situation. And for us, as Christians, hope is always dependent upon God. Though we may use the word hope as wishful thinking, hope is never based on a wish. Hope is never based on a positive feeling. Hope is based on God and God only. And it's based on God because God, He alone is able. What's that song that we sing? The songwriter, when he coined the song, he meant what he was saying. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. We sing the song because God has given us reason to trust. You see, for us, it's not our hope things get better, but rather when we trust in God, I know things are going to get better. I know because God lives. God is not a, a God of the dead. God is not dead. And I know he lives because God lives in me. You know he lives because he lives in you. It was him that woke us up this morning. It was him that started us on our way. It was him that kept us through our trials and tribulations. It was him that walks with us. It was him that talks with us. It was him that guides our very footsteps. Vision for a better future 
Is it based on wishful thinking? It's based upon the promise that points to Christ. Hope is not wrapped up in a season. It's not wrapped up in a program. It's not wrapped up in a new job. It's not wrapped up in a bigger house. It's not wrapped up in better cars. It's not wrapped up in things. It's wrapped up in God and our relationship with him. Listen to what Jeremiah says about Jesus. Jeremiah says, the Lord, our righteousness. Now, when the Bible talks about righteousness, righteousness is a term indicating relationship. In other words, a righteous person is someone who strives to live right with God and with his neighbor or her neighbor. You see, when we establish a relationship with God, his righteousness then becomes a part of us. For without God, none of us are righteous. Amen? You can put on the cleanest, nicest clothes you want, but that doesn't make you righteous if God is not in your heart. You see, none of us can get it right without, without a relationship with him. But we all know what the scriptures tells us, that the best we have to offer when we are at our best and on our best behavior, our best works are still as filthy rags in the sight of God. But Jesus, this lily of the valley, Jesus, this bright morning star, Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, the King of King and Lord of Lords, the doctor who never lost a patient and the lawyer who never lost a case, when he comes in, he washes us, redeems us, and makes us respectable in the sight of God. Yeah. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, my friends, he took upon himself our unrighteousness. And when he comes into our hearts, he washes us, he cleanses us, and he makes us his righteous. And that only happens when we have that relationship with him. He steps in, and we too begin to see him as the Lord, our righteousness. The one who gets it right, and the one who gets it right all the time. Hope is about a promise as well. And a person who comes into our hearts and changes us in the very present. In the present. See, hope is unlike hopelessness. Hopelessness is like walking around in darkness. That's what the children of Israel were doing. Their, 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 their future seemed so bleak, they were like walking around in darkness. Have you ever stumbled around in the dark? Have your lights ever gone out in the middle of the night? And you got, that's not a good feeling, is it? You don't know when you're going to bump your toe. You don't know if you're going to trip over something. Because you can't see where you're going. You're looking for the flashlight or you're looking for a candle. So something that will give you some light. It's not a good feeling to stumble around in the dark. Because for us, darkness is associated with bad things. The boogeyman lives in the dark. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's associated with unpleasant things. We tend to be scared of the dark. Mainly because we can't see where we're going. We can't see where our feet are taking us. We can't see the dangers around us. Those dangers that would be so apparent to us when we have light. There's something about darkness that makes us scared. Hopelessness is like walking around in spiritual darkness. But when we receive the light of Christ, we don't have to be afraid anymore. When we receive the light of Christ, we don't have to worry about evil anymore. When we receive the light of Christ, Christ comes into us, and we too can say as the prophet did, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Today our world is filled with darkness. People all around us are making decisions that just don't make sense. All because they don't trust God. 
But we must not allow the despair around us to overwhelm us. We are to live in the light of God's promise, the promise of hope. For God is the deliverer, he is the burden bearer, he's the way maker, and he is still working in this world. God's light brings life. His light brings clarity. His light brings peace of mind. His light brings safety. It drives away the gloom it, it, and it brings in hope. And the darkness around us must always give way to the light. If you light a match in the darkness of a deep cave, that small match becomes like a torch in the darkness. For the darkness must always give way to the light. The light of God's presence conquers even sin and death for the Christian. It provides comfort for those of us who suffer. It, it, it sets our hearts pounding with enthusiasm, knowing that he is our joy, knowing that he is our delight, knowing that he is our fulfillment, knowing that our hope in him will not be in vain. Hope says hold to God's hand, God's unchanging hand. And Isaiah says to us, better days are coming. God says to us this morning, if we have hope and trust in him, better days are coming. As we walk through this season of Advent, the season of waiting, the season of rejoicing, the season of fasting, the season of praying, let us center our hope on Christ and his promise that the church say, amen. 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 God be with you. Amen. 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 Amen